A uh, spokesman for the Art Gallery in Vancouver will be on the program early this week. We haven't quite tied down a date. It's International Archives Week around the world. And in Victoria, the Provincial Archives Building, a special display is in place, tracing some of the important events in history over the last 200 years of BC's past. Brian Coxford went over and found out, as he visited the archives, that the role of the archival collection is rapidly changing. And I think you'll enjoy this feature from Victoria. You might say the people in this building in the provincial archives have the power of life and death over events in BC history. Because it's in this building where books and documents, originals are kept. There's no other documents like them. If they disappear, events in BC history disappear. Um, well, I, we're, we're saving uh, various things for, uh, I think, two different reasons. One, any archive uh, has records that really have to be kept for the uh, proper functioning of any society. Uh, you think of land titles, you think of wills. In our le judicial system, how important uh, precedent is, uh, the, the legal documents, uh, court records need to be preserved. Uh, then you have uh, the records that don't necessarily have to be preserved for uh, the functioning of the world, but that people badly want to have preserved. Uh, paintings in our collection, of maps in our collection, a, a, a sort of, uh, not absolutely essential like bread and water, but a general uh, desire. Uh, for accessibility to uh, sort of to the past. And perhaps that's because the world is changing so very fast. Uh, the faster the world change, uh, changes, the greater the uh, demands on archives, the greater the curiosity uh, and the desire of the general public for the sort of materials we preserve. Terry, it was what, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 1894 when you first started collecting? Yes, um, the establishment of the Legislative Library uh, with its first librarian, uh, Gosnell, uh, also established a, a sort of Northwest history collection activity which uh, formed the basis of the collection which is displayed in this display which we see here today. Uh, an archives is a place that preserves uh, documentation uh, both from uh, government and from private sources uh, to document the uh, history of British Columbia okay. and its environment. That's environment, eh? So once the archivist has collected whatever it is, it may be photographs, it may be uh, manuscripts or large bodies of government records, he must uh, organize them, he pays special attention to putting them in acid-free containers, he makes preserve sure he, to preserve them, he, he wants to extend the life as long as he can. And then his, mm -hmm. his final task is to open them up to the public by making catalogs and indexes and various finding aids, as we call them, so that uh, people can find out what treasures we have here for them to, uh, to see. <clears throat> I see the heading on this one is, uh, why is Victoria the capital of British Columbia? And I guess we, uh, anybody who's been in here long enough would, uh, would uh, certainly know the arguments that uh, went on about New Westminster and Victoria and all the political hassles of the time. That's right. It's, uh, it goes back to our colonial history when this uh, area of North America was a colony uh, of uh, British Columbia, I mean of, um, of Great Britain. And in 66, the two colonies, 1866, the two colonies of uh, Vancouver uh, Island and British Columbia were joined. There had, of course, been a capital of each colony. They selected New Westminster as the capital of the combined colony, uh, called British Columbia, of course. But, of course, we know that's not the case today. No. Well, the, the preponderance of political uh, influence remained in Victoria. Um, there were... Um, that, w that would have been where James Douglas... Uh, that's where James Douglas had uh, pretty well uh, managed home, his eh? affair and called home. It had, uh, of course, uh, back from the days of Fort Victoria, it had a larger population, and that population exerted its influence to draw the capital from New Westminster to Victoria. Who do we owe the decision-making of the day for well, making Victoria the capital? The decision uh, rested with the governor of British Columbia at the time, uh, Frederick Seymour, uh, there is a picture there Frederick of him, and his cat. Yeah, sitting there on the, on the porch of his house with his cat. And, um, and um, there's the uh, colonial legislative buildings, uh, the bird cages, which some people will, uh, will know uh, burnt down uh, some 25 existed. years ago. That's as it, as it existed, existed in, in Frederick's day. Eh? That's right, in Frederick's day. Yeah. Well, this brings us to another aspect of uh, British Columbia's history, which is documented in the archives, uh, tourism in the in the Rockies. 
And I see we have um, just the person to uh, help us uh, learn what's displayed here, uh, Jack Webster's daughter, Linda Webster, who's working on this display right now. Linda? Oh, well, this, is a, uh, this is a panel on tourism in the Rockies. It, it, it began with, with the Canadian Pacific Railway in, in, in the 1880s. And this panel has been built around a painting by Frederick Marlott Bell Smith. So the province, in terms of its uh, early history, uh, was quick to capitalize on uh, tourism as a business then? Eh? Very much Or was so. it the CPR? It was, I, I would say it was the CPR rather than the government of the province. Though, of course, the, the, uh, the government travel bureau has been active for many, many years. How soon did, uh, did CPR actively get involved? Like, where were the very beginnings of tourism in BC? Oh, I would say that Glacier, the Glacier Hotel, was, 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 what, was one of the earlier. That goes back, what, to about spots. the manuscript I, I, there? I have the visitor's book for uh, January 18th, 1887 here. Which, men which mentions... Two years after the railway, eh? Right. Which mentions Bell Smith, the... The painter. Uh, the, the painter. Mm -hmm. These are uh, old tours and brochures, I guess. Uh, these are, are, are summer tours offered by the, by, by the CPR in um, 1890 through 96. Uh, I happen to have the brochure for 1894 on display. And then la later on, uh, there... Uh, there was a fashion for bungalow camps in the Rockies. This, this was, a lot of this happened in the 1920s. And this particular little pamphlet was, was published in the early 1920s. And um, into the modern era almost, eh? That's right. Uh, here we have a figure in British Columbia's uh, labor his history, uh, Ginger Goodwin, um, who is now known uh, uh, mostly for his, uh, his death, you might say. Um, he was in the uh, Kootenays area early in his career, but the last part of his career was spent in Vancouver Island, uh, where he was, uh, you might say, a wanted man. And what was his eventual fate? And he was uh, shot uh, on July 27th, 1918, by a special uh, constable, uh, Daniel Campbell. Um, you'll he see became he, a hero, of course. That he certainly, death, he certainly yeah. I suppose, won the one outstanding example of an authentic uh, labor hero. There have been songs about him, poems about him. Mm -hmm. um, you have here a um, picture of his uh, grave, as it was uh, years ago, and a picture of the uh, funeral procession um, that was given uh, in Cumberland. Goodwin in Cumberland. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Indian cutoff lands, uh, very much an issue in recent years, but uh, certainly not a new thing. That's right, and uh, this display, which I had uh, quite a bit to do with, uh, really uh, attempts to show some of the documentation for the understanding of this ongoing question. Probably uh, it would be fair to say that the whole question of uh, what lands Indians would occupy began the first time a white man, uh, or a European if you wish, uh, stepped uh, ashore on Vancouver Island. Uh, from but then many, on, the, but from to then, many white men, it was an issue that started five years ago, eh? That's right. Mm -hmm. but, and, and, and we have here, uh, the do, uh, uh, most of the documentation here is focusing on the particular commission in the period 1913 to 16, a uh, Joint Dominion Provincial Commission, which attempted to uh, come to yet another decision as to what uh, Indian lands uh, would be established for their own use. And during that commission, certain reserve lands were reduced in size, hence the term cut-off lands. It is interesting, perhaps just as a final note, to say that this is uh, perhaps, uh, uh, in, in my estimation, in some ways, the most interesting provincial archivist, uh, uh, Schofield, E.O.S. Schofield, who was a provincial archivist from 1910 to 1919. And he made collecting trips into the caribou. Here you see him with a gunny sack over his shoulder. Uh, and he would collect uh, materials relating to the history of early British Columbia and the caribou in particular. And he took, before the days of tapes, he took interviews and wrote down what people said in his notebooks. And so he was alive to oral history, which is now uh, a special division with the, uh, within the archives and taped interviews and other taped materials and sound archives generally are being preserved in that division now. So he there are four floors of records in this provincial archives, row upon row of documents, millions and millions of written words about the history of BC. And up until about now, most of the history recorded as the written word. And one of the oldest documents 
a ship's log, the Halcyon, which made a voyage from Bengal to the coast of Northwest America as far back as 1792. And it was Captain C.W. Barclay who uh, piloted that vessel and took his place in BC history. A hundred years later, professional photography had hit the West, as displayed in Carlton Watkins' pictorial journey through Northern California and Oregon. The Watkins album, according to the experts at the archives, is valued at $100,000 today. And of course, a great number of the records today, whether it's from the sheriff's office, government records, periodicals, newspapers, or from an electoral district on past elections are being recorded on microfilm. Which brings us to the future. The people at the archives have got perhaps a monumental task ahead of them. The degree of selection will be much more detailed because in the future, a good deal, the bulk of the history in BC will be recorded on videotape, a very expensive process. We're also going to become, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, sort of museums of technology because you have to have a, a machine that will enable a researcher to examine uh, the, the videotape, uh, listen to the sound, uh, play back a magnetic tape if it's factual information that is uh, put into a computer. Which brings us to dollars and cents. It's going to be a very costly matter. It's going to be much more costly. These rec if, it, if it's costly to create, it seems it's costly to preserve. That if you, uh, well, have a, write a letter longhand, it isn't very hard to just sort of place it on a shelf and it'll remain there. You can carry it to a reference room. Maintenance costs are low. Servicing costs are low. If you have a, a, a videotape uh, on that shelf, uh, you need a machine in your uh, research room that can be used by the public. That machine has to be maintained. It's costly to buy. Uh, the film itself has to be uh, rewound, looked after. In some cases, videotape seems to be uh, very short-lived from the archival point of view, and uh, videotape needs to be transferred onto uh, film, film of archival quality that can be counted on to last, uh, well... Hundreds of years. Uh, we, we hope so, given proper conditions. Mm -hmm.